next video, we're going to put some concepts to work from our first video about looking at coordination complexes. And the theory that we're going to use is called crystal field theory. It's going to explain some interesting and useful things about coordination complexes. So first off, what is crystal th field theory? And what it's trying to explain are some interesting things that happen when transition metals form bonds with ligands. And the basic idea is that a coordinate covalent bond, right? So what we call a coordinate covalent bond, is formed when the transition metals D orbitals interact with electrons on the ligands. And what I want to call your attention to is what D orbitals actually look like. So there are five of them. We knew that from when we drew electron configurations, we draw five lines for D orbitals, but they all have their own shapes. You notice that four of them look like clover leaves that are just turned in different directions. And then this fifth one looks like a dumbbell with a donut around the middle. And the thing is that when I form a complex, I'm interacting with the geometry of the d orbitals to form my bonds. Because remember, something like cobalt hexahydrate, right? This is an octahedral complex if you think about your Vesper theory. Well, I have a d orbital that lines up in a certain way with an octahedron. And I have a different d orbital that lines up in a different way. And what happens is those d orbitals interact with the ligands. And some of them are good interactions where they stabilize and go down in energy. Some of them are bad interactions where they destabilize and go up in energy. We call that crystal field splitting. And what that does, right, these are my five d orbitals. And they're what we call degenerate. So in the presence of six waters, iron's d orbitals split into three down and two up. And the EG and the T2G, do not worry about those. Those are special names for them that if you want to learn more, you go take advanced inorganic chemistry with Dr. Salupa later. But you notice that three down and two up is a pattern. And then there's a size of a gap. We call that gap delta. And that delta turns out to control an awful lot of things about the compound. So let's explore that a little bit more. One of the really interesting things about crystal field theory is that the type of splitting can vary based on the geometry. So if I have a complex that's linear where I have my metal in the middle and two things pointing out, the d orbitals actually split two, two, one. If I have a square planar with the metal in the middle and the four Comp, uh, the four ligands around in a square, they split two, one, one, one. A tetrahedron with the metal in the middle and then the one sticking up in the kind of tripod shape, they go two up and three down. And then last but not least, octahedral, remember metal in the middle, square plane around the center and then one sticking up, one sticking down, they go three up, two down. You do not need to worry about what pattern happens. I will give you the right pattern that you need for the right situation and the right geometry. I just want you to be aware that the geometries vary. Regardless, though, the approach is always the same. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to count the D electrons. Hey, we did that before in an earlier video, didn't we? And then we're going to put them in the right orbitals, just like we did in electron configurations. Remember we had lines and we'd put two or we'd go one, one, one and fill, right? We're gonna do that again with our d orbitals. We just have some slightly different rules. Our rules have to do with what's called what, uh, whether a ligand is low spin or high spin. And a high spin ligand says I would fill all of the electrons into the orbital separately, and then I'd go back and pair. That is high spin. Low spin is I'm going to fill the bottom before I fill the top. I will tell you whether a ligand is high spin or low spin. It has to do with what's called its ligand field strength, and I'll show it to you, but I will tell you whether a ligand is going to make, and by the way, High spin means small gap and 
low spin means large gap, right? So that, um, that will control that. But as long as you can count them and put them into a diagram, you're golden. So here's some properties that are influenced by crystal field theory. First off, of course, gap size. So like I was saying, the ligand matters. So um, whether I'm an iodide or a water or a cyanide matters to how big this gap gets. Things on the left are called weak field ligands and they have a small delta. Things on the right are strong field ligands. They have a high delta. I'll tell you which is which. I just wanted you to be aware that this exists. Once we know delta and once we know how to get electrons in, we can look at magnetic properties. So we can tell whether a complex is what we call paramagnetic, has unpaired electrons. So this one right here is certainly paramagnetic because it's got one, two, three, four unpaired electrons. On the other hand, a diamagnetic compound has all of its electrons paired up. So being able to tell that is important. The last thing that's cool is that the color of a complex is influenced by the size of the delta. And so what I want you to know first off is that the size of the delta will correspond to a color of visible light. So for example, this delta for an iron with six waters around it, hexa-aqua iron two is what this is called. Please do not learn how to name these. Hexa-aqua iron two has a 600 nanometer gap. So our delta zero is red light if I look at my color below. On this uh, side, on the other hand, hexa-cyano iron three is what this is. Iron two, actually, sorry. There's an iron three as well. This gap, 420 nanometers, if I look at my color wheel, is violet. That makes sense, right? This is the higher energy between red, right? Between red light and violet light. Violet light has a higher energy, so that's important. The gap is always in terms of energy. So small wavelengths are big energies. But what I want you to understand is that iron. Right? This is called ferrocyanide, the way I drew it. Ferrocyanide is yellow in color, right? So in solution, it's yellow. You notice that violet and yellow are not the same, right? This iron one is pale green in solution, right? So delta is not the color seen. Instead, we've talked about this in lab already. There's a complementary um, relationship that happens, right? It looks green because it absorbs red. And let me change colors so this is actually visible. There we go, right? The delta was there. The color that I saw was across the way. The delta was violet, but the color that I saw was yellow. Go across the color wheel to get your color. Another caveat that's super important is that you have to have a transition metal with d electrons and there has to be space in the d orbitals. So the reason that this happens is because when, and when the complex absorbs 600 nanometer light, for example, this electron moves up here. Or when this complex absorbs 420 nanometer light, an electron moves up here. So first off, no d electrons, no movement, right? It doesn't matter that it absorbs light. There's no, there's nothing to do the absorbing. Second off, no space, no movement. If these orbitals have been totally full, they can't take on something else. And so you wouldn't see color. Keep that in mind, because sometimes you might get lost or suckered in when you're working on a complex, if you find that out. Let's try three of them. So here's our practice. One at a time here. Here's one with titanium. And what I would like you to do is I would like you to go back to our original stuff, find the coordination number, find the charge, 
and then paramagnetic or diamagnetic and predict color, which means that you're going to have to find the number of D electrons and put them in the diagram, right? That's underneath all of this, right? Need D electrons diagram. So pause the video, give this a try, and I'll reveal the answers. All right, here are our important pieces of information. First off, six ligands, so coordination number six. Second off, water is neutral, so that three plus charge goes on the titanium. Third off, if titanium is three plus, then you have one D electron left. And so I have to just start filling on the bottom. Paramagnetic is my next conclusion because I have unpaired electrons. And then I look at that 580 nanometer light, I notice that it lives in yellow. So my complex is going to be violet. Let's try another. All right, let's take a look at this cobalt complex. And this time you need a little more information because you're going to have more electrons. Chloride is a weak field ligand. Give it a try. All right. This time the coordination number is four because there's only four ligands. And since all those chlorines are minus one, the cobalt has to be plus two to make the charge. The, um, char the electron configuration ends up being argon 3D4. And this is where weak field versus strong field matters because weak field means high spin. It means fill all the orbitals and then go back and pair. So I go one, two, three, four. Right? If this had been a strong field ligand, I would have filled the bottom and then the top, but they fill equally now. Because of that, this complex is paramagnetic. Right? It's got a bunch of unpaired electrons. And that wavelength of 590 nanometers is orange, so the complex is blue. All right, let's try one more. And in this particular one, it actually doesn't matter what the delta is. So let's go ahead and try this, pause, and see where you end up. So to take stock, in the zinc, um, hexacyano zinc 2 plus, the zinc is a 2 plus coordination number of 6. When I take two electrons off of zinc, I end up with 3D10. And so you notice that all of my orbitals are filled up. All of my 10 electrons are in the five orbitals. That makes this complex diamagnetic because all the electrons are paired. Now, here's the fun part, right? There's no space for transition. Color comes from an electron moving up. Well, there's no place for it to move to. No space, no room at the end, can't do it. And so what that means is that this complex is colorless. So it's possible for coordination complexes to be colorless when there's no room for the electrons to move or there's no electrons to move at all. I wanted to put that in so that you were aware of it.